cautious as serpents among wolves. Brother Franz, the Vice President of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, is here to speak to us. He has served us for many years and we appreciate it very much. So we're going to enjoy listening to him again as he speaks on Cautious as Serpents Among Wolves, Brother Franz. To his 12 special representatives, his 12 apostles, Jesus said, Look, I am sending you forth as sheep among wolves. Jesus was sending them forth to preach good news, which should have been grabbed at by people that had been disgusted with human governments. As you go, said he, preach, saying, the kingdom of the heavens has drawn near. And yet, sending them out to preach such a winsome message would be putting them seemingly at the cruel mercy of wolves. Who then were the wolves? Today, Jesus' words, look, I am sending you forth as sheep amidst wolves, take in all the earth. Since A.D. 1914, when World War I broke out, Jesus' command to his sheep-like followers applies. This good news of the kingdom will be preached in all the inhabited earth for the purpose of a witness to all the nations, and then the accomplished end will come. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of the heavens, has drawn near more fully now than when Jesus sent out the twelve apostles to preach. For in 1914, Jehovah God took to himself his great power and seated his son, Jesus Christ, upon the throne to rule as king in the midst of his enemies. And thus the kingdom of God came into power in the heavens. How are the kingdom preachers to survive amidst wolves and still stay sheep-like, harmless, obedient to their shepherd's voice. Our shepherd has told us how. After forewarning his disciples of the wolves all around, he said, Therefore, prove yourselves cautious as serpents and innocent as doves. Be on your guard against men. Six thousand years ago, the serpent, mentioned as being in Eden, did not have to fight against a ravenous wolf. It found itself watched by an innocent, unsuspecting woman. The account reads, Now the serpent proved to be the most cautious of all the wild beasts of the field that Jehovah God had made. So it began to say to the woman, is it really so that God said you must not eat from every tree of the garden? The serpent did not have to protect itself against a wolf. Hence, it did not withdraw cautiously, but thrust its attentions upon the woman Eve. Why? To deceive. The Apostle Paul says, The serpent seduced Eve by its craftiness. The woman was thoroughly deceived and came to be in transgression. Behind the scenes, the devil maneuvered the serpent into its deceptive actions and words, making it act craftily with the intent of injuring. Its lie induced human disobedience. Death followed to mankind. In being cautious as serpents, May we use such craftiness against wolves? In the ancient Hebrew scriptures, we find many examples of where Jehovah's servants used caution, among them Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, David, and Jonathan. Did they disgrace themselves as liars in doing so? Let us examine the background of their actions. 
To escape a severe famine in Palestine, Abraham did not return to Ur of the Chaldeans. He had left Ur forever at God's command, but went down to Egypt. Abraham may have heard of the incident now found recorded on a papyrus of where an Egyptian pharaoh, influenced by his princes, sent armed troops and took another man's beautiful wife away for his own harem. Near Egypt, Abraham told Sarah to hide the fact that she was his wife. They will certainly kill me, but you they will preserve alive. Please say you are my sister in order that it may go well with me on your account, and my soul will be certain to live due to you. Pharaoh took Sarah to make her his wife, but Jehovah plagued Pharaoh and his house, calling to his notice that Sarah was Abraham's wife. So Pharaoh returned her, but complained to Abraham for not having been told the full facts that might have prevented this. Years later, Abraham was in Philistine country at Gerar, and Abraham repeated concerning Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. Why? As Abraham later explained to Abimelech, king of Gerar, who had taken Sarah, it was because I said to myself, doubtless there is no fear of God in this place, and they will certainly kill me because of my wife. And besides, she is truly my sister, the daughter of my father, only not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. And it came about that when God caused me to wander from the house of my father, then I said to her, this is your loving kindness, which you may exercise toward me. At every place where we shall come, say of me, he is my brother. Very likely, Sarah was pregnant with her only son, Isaac, at this time. Almighty God acted to prevent Abimelech from defiling Sarah by warning him in a dream, saying, Now return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will make supplication for you. So keep living. When returning Sarah, King Abimelech gave Abraham a thousand silver shekels and said to Sarah, Here it is for you, a covering of the eyes to all who are with you and before everybody, and you are cleared of reproach. At Abraham's supplication, God healed Abimelech and his wife and slave girls so that their wombs were opened again to bear children. Will you call Abraham on the above two occasions a liar and a prevaricator? If you do, then you are obliged to ask, did Jehovah God use a liar and a faithless coward to supplicate him to heal Abimelech who had acted in his innocence. To understand God's action toward his prophet Abraham, we should think not merely of God's faithfulness toward his covenant with Abraham, but of the circumstances back there. Whether in Egypt or in Palestine, Abraham was in enemy territory and needed to exercise caution. He wanted to live to carry out God's purpose toward him. He saw good to use strategy toward those who might be provoked to injure or kill him in Jehovah's service. He could have gone to war with them. With 318 of his household slaves, Abraham had once put to rout the armies of four kings from Mesopotamia who invaded Palestine and carried off his nephew Lot and his household. But Abraham chose to maintain peaceful relations with the inhabitants of lands 
where he sojourned. He was not disposed to go to war with them over his wife. In those days, before Jehovah made his law covenant with Abraham's descendants through the mediator Moses, women were property. They were expendable. Remember how Lot offered to let the howling mob of sodomites have his two marriageable or espoused daughters for their lust in order to protect the lives of the two men whom he had as guests in his house. Remember, too, how the old man of Gibeah offered his virgin daughter and his guest's concubine to a like mob of Benjaminites in order to protect the religious Levite whom he was entertaining. Finally, this Levite himself took his concubine wife whom he was taking back home and put her outside the house at the mercy of the mob to her death. So, Abraham represented Sarah as his sister to prevent violent controversy over his wife. Sarah recognized Abraham as her Lord and agreed to the arrangement, willing to take the consequences of the arrangement. She was willing to do her part to preserve the life of Jehovah's prophet with whom he had made his covenant. Abraham looked upon this as an expression of her loving kindness to him, and Sarah viewed it in the same way. But critics do not view it that way. They view Abraham wholly as a lying, prevaricating, weakling coward, and not a cautious strategist in an enemy land filled with wolves. Since God saw good to keep Abraham in his covenant and to pre protect Sarah undefiled for her husband, may we see in this line of strategy a picture? We know that elsewhere Abraham is used to picture Jehovah God and Sarah is used to picture Jehovah's heavenly womanly organization that produces the promised seed, the Christ. So we may see in Abraham's conduct how, over the centuries, Jehovah has seemed to repudiate his organizational wife or hide her wifely relationship to him. He withheld from her the promised seed so long, and he also lets those on earth who are her spiritual children suffer at the hands of men and devils, seemingly without divine protection. All this has given the enemy the wrong impression, and they have felt free to try to defile the representatives of Jehovah's wifely organization. But in fulfillment of his covenant respecting Christ, Jehovah has protected them amid their trying situation and has delivered them in their integrity. Following his father Abraham's example, Isaac likewise spoke of his wife Rebekah as his sister to the men of the same city of Gerar. Her true connection with Isaac was discovered by King Abimelech, who then said to Isaac, a little more, and certainly one of the people would have cohabited with your wife, and you would have brought guilt upon us. King Abimelech should have added, if Jehovah had permitted it. Peaceable Isaac explained his strategy, saying, I said that she is my sister, for fear I should die on her account. After that brush with King Abimelech, over Rebekah, Jehovah continued to bless Abraham, Isaac to the extent that the Philistines became envious of him. We may find 
in Isaac's handling of matters with his wife, Rebecca, the same motivation as that which was behind Abraham's handling of matters with his wife, Sarah. We may view both handlings from the same standpoint. Abraham and Isaac may have had a fear, but they did not in fear make an ungodly alliance with pagan kings for self-protection. Jehovah always delivered Abraham and Isaac because they shunned the world. Rahab, the harlot, innkeeper of uh, Jericho, generally comes in for condemnation as a deceiver. She took the two spies from the nearby camp of Israel into her house because she feared their god Jehovah. When the king of Jericho sent men and demanded that she bring out the two spies, should Rahab have led the king's officers up to the rooftop and brushed away the stalks of flax laid in rows over the men, thus exposing their concealment and thus handing them over to suffer the fate of spies? Would that have been trusting in their God to protect them? Would that have pleased Jehovah and shown she had faith in him and had adopted his cause? Did it not rather require strength of faith in Jehovah to refuse the king's command and to turn his officers away with a misdirection. She said, yes, the men did come to me and I did not know from where they were. And it came about at the closing of the gate by dark that the men went out. I, I just do not know where the men have gone. Chase after them quickly for you will overtake them. Was she immorally lying there? Remember that there was war then. The enemies did not deserve to learn the truth to the hurt or endangerment of Jehovah's servants. In wartime, it is proper to misdirect the wolfish enemy. While the king's misdirected men were gone in a vain pursuit, Rahab helped the two spies to escape over the city wall. God's word, does it condemn her? No, it commends her action as the practical proof of her faith, saying, in the same manner was not also Rahab the harlot declared righteous by works after she had received the messengers hospitably and sent them out by another way than the one she had indicated to the king's officers. So the lives of Rahab and her relatives were spared when Jericho's walls came tumbling down and all the other city folk were wiped out. David, the killer of the Philistine giant Goliath, was cautious as a serpent toward the wolfish king Saul and others. David withdrew from the jealous, murder-minded king Saul in time of danger, never once trying to strike back to Saul's injury. Seeing that Saul had declared war on innocent David, David's friends used war strategy to protect him. Saul's daughter, Michael, helped her husband, David, escape through a window. She held back Saul's officers with the announcement, he is sick. She substituted an image for David in his bed. And when the bed with the image was carried to King Saul and Michael's work for David's escape was exposed, she said to her indignant father, he himself said to me, Send me away. Why should I put you to death? King Saul called it deceptive trickery. It was, in effect, war strategy for protecting the innocent. Michael's brother Jonathan 
who loved David also used strategy to throw his insanely jealous father off David's track. David, in flight, came to the high priest Ahimelech at Nob. When asked why he came alone, David concealed his movement, saying, The king himself commanded me as to a matter, and he went on to say to me, Let no one know anything at all of the matter concerning which I am sending you and concerning which I have commanded you. This protected the high priest from feeling under any pressure to betray David's whereabouts to King Saul. But there was one who did betray David's whereabouts to King Saul. Doeg, the Edomite, Saul's chief shepherd, he was there at the time, and when he reported it to Saul, he was rewarded. Yes, but how? Doeg was rewarded by King Saul with the order to kill Jehovah's high priest and 84 of his under priests, innocent men. But God rewarded Doeg differently. He inspired David to compose Psalm 52 against this malicious Edomite informer, as the Psalms superscription shows. David took refuge in the land of Philistia with Achish, the king of Gath. When the Philistines discovered who he was and suggested to the king that this David was a security risk, David became afraid of wolves. The account says, so he disguised his sanity under their eyes and began acting insane in their hand and kept making cross marks on the doors of the gate and letting his saliva run down on his beard. King Achish refused to have him around and let him go with his life like a harmless idiot. Thus, David was able to get out alive and to the cave of Adullam. However much his pretended insanity before King Achish worked toward his escape, yet David was inspired to write Psalm 34 and thank Jehovah for blessing his strategy and giving him deliverance from King Achish. And in verses 12 and 13 of this psalm, David says, What man is he that desireth life, and loveth many days, that he may see good? Keep thy tongue from evil, and thy lips from speaking guile. Thus you see, this Psalm 34, composed by David, after pretending insanity before King Achish, expresses no sense of sin and wrongdoing by David for having given King Achish the wrong impression in order to effect his escape. Later, David returned under different conditions and was assigned by King Achish to live at Ziklag. Again, David used war strategy toward this enemy of David's people, Israel, and David concealed his movements from King Achish. So Achish did not molest David and his men. In time, David became king over Israel at Jerusalem. When his son Absalom conspired against him to seize the throne, David's most trusted counselor, Ahithophel, turned traitor against him and joined the conspiracy. While in flight from Jerusalem, David learned of Ahithophel's traitorousness. And the account says, At this David said, Turn, please, the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness, O Jehovah. Now, how did David act in harmony with this prayer? When Hushai, 
the archites wanted to join David in his flight, David sent him back to Jerusalem saying, if you return to the city and you actually say to Absalom, I am your servant, O king. I used to prove myself the servant of your father, even I at that time, but now even I am your servant. Then you will certainly frustrate the counsel of Ahithophel for me. Was David teaching Hushai to lie? Hushai returned and professed to become the servant of Absalom. In a choice between Ahithophel's counsel and Hushai's, Absalom and his men preferred Hushai's. Frustrated, Ahithophel went home and strangled himself, Judas-like. Hushai's counsel allowed for David to escape to safety and to prepare for the battle to regain his throne. Jehovah blessed Hushai's strategy according to David's own instructions and frustrated Ahithophel's counsel in answer to David's prayer. When two men were detected bearing word from Hushai to David in the wilderness, then a woman like Rahab proved to be at hand. The two men had hid in the courtyard well of her husband. This woman spread a covering over the well top and heaped up cracked grain upon it. And when Absalom's servants came and asked about the two message bearers, the account says, the woman said to them, they passed on from here to the waters. After Absalom's servants were off, on a vain hunt, the two men came out of the well and made their way to David. All this war strategy baffled the enemy, but it worked towards David's success in battle against Absalom and for his restoration to Israel's throne. In a true confession, David prayed, Thou hast redeemed me, O Jehovah, Thou God of truth. Since Jehovah is the God of truth, can we find lies in the mouths of his prophets? Take the case of his approved prophet, Elisha. Because Elisha repeatedly exposed to the king of Israel the lyings in wait of the Syrian armies, the enraged king of Syria sent a big military force and surrounded the city of Dothan to capture Elisha. When it began its assault on the city, Elisha prayed to Jehovah, please strike this nation with blindness. Jehovah answered. The account says, so he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. Did Elisha now turn liar to these blind Syrians and thus bring himself under the curse of God's law which says, Cursed is the one who causes the blind to go astray in the way. For we read, Elisha now said to them, This is not the way and this is not the city. Follow me and let me conduct you to the man you look for. However, he conducted them to Samaria. Instead of surrendering himself to them as the man they were looking for at the city, Dothan, Elisha led them away from Dothan to Samaria to the king of Israel. But he did not do this for their injury. He did it to magnify Jehovah's power, superiority, and mercy before all the Syrians. We read, and it came about that as soon as they arrived at Samaria, Elisha then said, O Jehovah, open the eyes of these that they may see. Immediately, Jehovah opened their eyes and they got to see and hear 
They were in the middle of Samaria. They saw that they had been misled with their eyes wide open and by the very man they had looked for. They must have been very frightened as well as amazed. But Elisha showed he intended them no harm. He prevented the king of Israel from striking them and had the king spread a feast for them, thus heaping coals of fire upon their heads. Then he sent them back unharmed to Syria. In place of making himself a moral liar here, Elisha used war strategy to divert the Syrians from their wrong purpose. And Jehovah God cooperated with Elisha in this maneuver. Thus, Jehovah vindicates Elisha against the cry of liar. The case of a still earlier prophet also presents itself. For his own name's sake, Jehovah had enabled King Ahab of Israel to gain a second victory over the Syrians. Yes, and to capture King Ben-Hadad himself. Displeasingly to Jehovah, who had delivered the enemy Ben-Hadad into his hand for death, King Ahab let him go with a covenant or treaty between them at that. So Jehovah's prophet had a man strike him and wound him. How now did this prophet notify Ahab of his sin and its consequences? We read, Then the prophet went and stood still for the king by the road, and he kept himself disguised with a bandage over his eyes. Was this disguise a misleading imposition upon an innocent, unsuspecting man. But this disguise was not all there was to it. For as the king was passing by, the prophet cried out and said to the king, Your servant himself went out into the thick of battle, and look, a man was leaving the line, and he came bringing a man to me and then said, Guard this man. If he should in any way be missing, then your soul will have to take the place of his soul, or else a talent of silver you will weigh out. And it came about that as your servant was active here and there, why, he himself was gone. Was there any truth in that? You will call it a lie. Why then did Jehovah's prophet tell it? It was really an illustration of what King Ahab had done or took in the same principle. Only the prophet did not make Ahab the offender in the illustration, but made himself the offender. Thus Ahab could feel free to pronounce an impartial judgment according to the principle of this type of conduct, because his judgment was against another man not recognized as a prophet. That was why the prophet told what the critics would call a lie, but it drew wicked King Ahab to an impartial expression of judgment. The account says, at this the king of Israel said to him, thus your own judgment is. You yourself have decided. But the king of Israel had in fact uttered judgment upon his own self. He had decided against himself. For the prophet now undisguised himself and said to Ahab, This is what Jehovah has said. For the reason that you have let go out of your hand the man devoted to me for destruction, your soul must take the place of his soul, and your people the place of his people. This son of the prophets goes down in Bible history, not as a liar, but as a strategist. And to his vindication, his prophecy against Ahab came true.
King Ahab went home, judged worthy of death according to his own judgment. Later, he sees Naboth's vineyard after the murder of this man by false witnesses under Queen Jezebel's orders. This brought Jehovah's further pronouncement of death sentence upon Ahab. Moreover, the despised dogs were to lick up Ahab's royal blood. His queen was to be eaten up by dogs, and all his household were to fall to be eaten up by dogs and birds like so much carrion. Time came for Ahab to go to his execution, and lies played an important part in the death march and even implicated God. How? Ahab got King Jehoshaphat of Judah to ally himself with him in war against Ramoth Gilead, then held by the Syrians. To pry into the future, King Ahab religiously consulted his false prophets, about 400 of them. They prophesied favorably, saying, Go up, and Jehovah will give it into the king's hand. Thus they tied in Jehovah with their lying. At King Jehoshaphat's request for a recognized prophet of Jehovah, King Ahab had the hated Micaiah brought before them. When Micaiah sarcastically mimicked Ahab's lying prophets, Ahab put Micaiah under oath to tell him the truth. Micaiah did so, foreseeing that Ahab's armies would be scattered like shepherdless sheep. Then, to show up the liars, Micaiah added, Hear the word of Jehovah. I certainly see Jehovah sitting upon his throne, and all the army of the heavens standing by him to his right and to his left. And Jehovah proceeded to say, Who will fool Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And this spirit began to say something like this, while that spirit was saying something like that. Finally, a spirit came out and stood before Jehovah and said, I myself shall fool him. At that Jehovah said to him, By what means? To this he said, I shall go forth, and I shall certainly become a deceptive spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. So Jehovah said, You will fool him, and what is more, you will come off the winner. Go out and do that way. And now, here, Jehovah has put a deceptive spirit into the mouth of all these prophets of yours. But Jehovah himself has spoken calamity concerning you. For this, the false prophet Zedekiah stepped up and struck Micaiah on the cheek with a remark meaning that he and not Micaiah had Jehovah's spirit or that Jehovah's spirit had spoken true by him, but the lying spirit had passed to Micaiah. To keep the court record straight, Micaiah said that Zedekiah would one day see whether that was true. When King Ahab sent Micaiah off to prison to a bread and water diet till his return in victory, Micaiah said, if you return at all in peace, Jehovah has not spoken with me. Ahab's death in battle, despite his disguise at Ramoth Gilead, followed by the dogs licking his blood off his chariot, proves that Jehovah, not a deceptive spirit, had spoken by Micaiah. But how had one of Jehovah's spirit creatures become a lying or deceptive spirit? And how could the God of truth authorize him to become a deceptive spirit in the mouth of all of Ahab's prophets? In this way, 
Ahab wanted to be encouraged in a suicidal course of action by lying prophets. He showed this when he imprisoned Micaiah for telling the unpleasant truth. Lies were what Ahab wanted to hear to his own death. So Jehovah was agreeable to Ahab's hearing lies then because Ahab was sentenced to death and the time for his execution was at hand. Jehovah did not interfere by exercising his spirit upon Ahab's prophets to make them tell the truth. As when one of Jehovah's angels turned the prophet Balaam's curse into a blessing upon Israel. One of Jehovah's spirit creatures saw the need of the lie to prevail, to induce Ahab on to his own execution by having the liars outnumber the truth-telling Micaiah. A spirit creature from Jehovah God has power to make an inferior creature talk, even a dumb brute like Balaam's ass. So this spirit offered to exercise his power upon Ahab's 400 prophets to speak, just to speak, letting them speak out of their own hearts what they wanted to speak to please the one supporting them, their king. Thus, the spirit creature or angel was responsible not for their lies, but merely for their speaking. Jehovah was agreeable to the angels doing this because Jehovah wanted to show that it is disastrous to rely on lying prophets and also because it was the time for his sentence of death to be executed upon Ahab. Jehovah knew that Ahab desired to be fooled by the lie, especially when the liars were so many. Hence, Jehovah told the spirit creature that the operation of his power upon Ahab's prophets would open the way for them to utter the death-dealing lie, and it would win out over the faithful warning of Jehovah's one prophet, Micaiah. It did, and Ahab shed his blood like an executed criminal's for canines to lick, and Jehovah, the God of truth, stood exonerated of lies. Do we have to turn to the ancient past to see this manner of divine operation at work? No. We see Jehovah acting according to the same rule of action today in this 20th century to fulfill his own warning prophecy. His prophecy, written by means of the Apostle Paul, reads, the coming of the lawless one by the activity of Satan will be with all power and with pretended signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are to perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends upon them a strong delusion to make them believe what is false so that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. The peoples of this world now face Armageddon and are about to perish there in horrifying numbers. Why? Because the truth is not available for them? No. For Jehovah's Witnesses are preaching the good news of his triumphant kingdom in all the inhabited earth for a witness to all nations. It is really because the people, as the years of this kingdom proclamation by Jehovah's Witnesses in more and more countries have proved, refuse to love the truth and so be saved from destruction at Armageddon. They prefer the wicked deception which accompanies the activity of Satan since he was ousted from heaven. And they prefer the deception because they have pleasure in unrighteousness.
In view of the above given scriptural examples, Jesus was in harmony with the spirit of Jehovah God in instructing his apostles when he sent them out as sheep among wolves. Prove yourselves cautious as serpents and yet innocent as doves. Since the unchristian wolves declare war upon the sheep and choose to make themselves fighters actually against God, it is proper for the inoffensive sheep to use war strategy toward the wolves in the interests of God's work. No one against whom this strategy is used is unrighteously hurt because of it, whereas the sheep or those interests that deserve to be protected are safeguarded. God does not oblige us to show the stupidity of sheep and play into the hands of our fighting enemy. We should meet the offspring of vipers, the seed of the serpent, with the cautiousness of serpents. Foreseeing danger, we should cover ourselves against the wolves that prey upon Jehovah's flock. Oppressive wolves will enter in among you and will not treat the flock with tenderness. Therefore, keep awake, says Paul. And the proverb adds, A prudent man seeth the evil and hideth himself. It is proper to cover over our arrangements for the work that God commands us to do. If the wolfish foes draw wrong conclusions from our maneuvers to outwit them, no harm has been done to them by the harmless sheep, innocent in their motives as doves. The action is not out of a liar's hatred. The proverb says, He that hideth hatred is of lying lips, and he that uttereth a slander is a fool. A lying tongue hateth those whom it has wounded. We cannot condemn as a liar and deceiver the witness of Jehovah that was about to cross the borderland back into Nazi Germany and who took Bible literature with her at the risk of her freedom. She put the literature in the baby carriage at the feet of her baby and covered it over with unwashed baby diapers. When the Nazi officer inspected her carriage, dug down into it, and got his hand in touch with the wet, dirty diapers, he quickly jerked back his hand in disgust, crying out, Ach, Dreck! He let her cross the border. And with her, the literature went in to feed many of the oppressed, brutally treated sheep under Hitler's regime. <laughs> then there is the witness who was working from house to house with a basket of literature. Enemies reported her to the police as the woman with a shirt waist of a certain color. So she ducked around the corner, took out a shirt waist of another color and made a change, then walked back down the same street and passed the officer on her trail and escaped being identified. <laughs> there is the brother too and some of you are going to see him in Germany, God willing, who was sentenced to the quarries from which no one was known to come out alive. As a skilled musician, he was spared the killing quarry work, but he was not mindful of his own life only. At risk of his own privilege as the musical entertainer of the camp officer, he smuggled portions of food to his underfed brothers sentenced to back-breaking quarry work and thus 
was able to keep them alive. When at last deliverance came in 1945, not only he, but those whom he had fed contrary to Nazi regulations emerged with him from the place of doom. To this day, the history of Jehovah's Witnesses is ever new, with like cases of their outwitting the wolves by exercising due caution in the face of danger while they are engaged in a good, loving work according to God's will and command. Such outwitting of oppressors of the sheep is not a failure to render therefore unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, it is a courageous, sensible way of rendering first unto God the things that are God's. <laughs> if the wolfish enemy drives Jehovah's people underground like David, who was driven by Saul into the cave of Adullam and other caves, then the underground worship of Jehovah's Witnesses is not a work of deceit and lies just because it is not done above ground under the greedy eyes of the voracious wolves. The hypocrisy and deceit lie with the wolves who openly make of God's house a cave of robbers. We do not have anything wrong to cover over from wolfish enemies. But if there is anything wrong, we cannot cover it over from Jehovah. We dare not lie against him. Ananias and his wife Sapphira tried to lie to God for the sake of putting on an all-out generous appearance before the apostles and the rest of the Jerusalem congregation. Peter asked Ananias, To what end has Satan emboldened you to play false to the Holy Spirit? You have played false, not to men, but to God. The Holy Spirit in Peter sharpened his perceptions to see that Ananias was trying to lie to God, and the Spirit immediately killed Ananias. After he dropped dead and was carried away, his wife came in and put the Spirit in Peter to the test by trying to keep up the pretense. Peter asked, why was it agreed upon between you two to make a test of the spirit of Jehovah? Instantly, she dropped dead. We dare not lie against God's word, adding to it or taking away from it, reading into it what it does not say, and denying, passing over, or explaining away what it does truthfully say. Every word of God is tried. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. We may not tell untruths in Jehovah's name, for that puts God in the light of a liar. Let God be found true, though every man be found a liar. In Jeremiah's day, the false prophets prophesied lies in Jehovah's name, and they lied against his purpose foretelling in his name what he had not foretold. Therefore, Jehovah was against them. He executed judgment against them at Jerusalem's destruction in 607 before Christ. Religious liars, there are like them today, but they cannot escape a judgment like that of the liars of Jeremiah's day, but they will meet an end like theirs at the coming battle of Armageddon. <laughs> Never swear falsely in Jehovah's name. Jehovah declares that at his temple he will be a swift witness against the false swearers. Never take an oath in Jehovah's name and tell lies as a sworn witness. But what about Rahab of Jericho. Well, Rahab of Jericho was under no oath in Jehovah's name to tell the facts to the king's officers, and hence she was not a false swearer 
or a false witness. A faithful witness will not lie, but a false witness uttereth lies. A faithful witness does not love a false oath. So he tells the truth as he swore to do. What he does speak will be the truth. If he speaks at all, he will tell the truth. To the extent that he chooses to talk, he will state the truth. If, for conscientious reasons, he refuses to tell everything, he will be willing to suffer the consequence if he be judged worthy of a penalty. He refuses to tell everything not to escape punishment, but facing punishment for conscientious reasons. Even Jesus kept silent before Pilate, refusing to answer, though knowing Pilate's power. Never take an oath to do a thing and then prove false to it by failing to do what you swore to do. That means to prove false to the oath of Jehovah. It means swearing falsely in making covenants. Shimei, that man who cursed the fleeing King David, swore in Jehovah's name to King Solomon not to budge outside of Jerusalem the rest of his days. When Shimei proved false to his oath by leaving Jerusalem to recover two escaped slaves, King Solomon said to him on his return, Why then did you not keep the oath of Jehovah and the commandment that I, the king, solemnly laid upon you? For proving false to Jehovah's oath, Shimei died with his blood upon his own head. Likewise, Zedekiah, Jerusalem's last king of David's line, acted a lie against the oath of Jehovah. This oath in Jehovah's name, King Zedekiah made before King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon to guarantee that he, Zedekiah, would be obediently subject to his Babylonian overlord. After eight years of keeping this covenant with Nebuchadnezzar, Zedekiah looked to Egypt for help and rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar, thus despising the oath of Jehovah and uh, suggesting that nothing could be guaranteed by Jehovah's name. Therefore, thus saith the Lord Jehovah, as I live, surely mine oath that he hath despised and my covenant with Nebuchadnezzar that he hath broken I will even bring it upon his own head. Zedekiah felt how Jehovah hated false oaths and false swearers. When his own city, Jerusalem, fell, when his sons were killed before his eyes, when his own eyes were then blinded, and when he himself was carried off captive to Babylon to die. The nation of Israel accepting a false, a faithful remnant, was a large-scale example of proving false to the oath of Jehovah, entering into a covenant with him by an oath, and rebelliously failing to carry out that covenant. The nation of Israel and Shimei and Zedekiah are examples of warning to us not to treat lightly our own oath of Jehovah in dedicating ourselves to him through Christ and then not carrying out that dedication faithfully in full obedience to his will. His command to us is, Ye are my witnesses, saith Jehovah. His king, Jesus Christ, reigns since 1914, and the king's command to us is, This good news of the kingdom, will be preached in all the inhabited earth for the purpose of a witness to all the nations. In Jehovah's name, we are sworn to obey these two distinct commands. The word of the wise man, therefore, to us is very appropriate. Keep the king's commandment 
and that on account of the oath of God. This we will determinately do in carrying out our king's instructions for preaching in the field. We will follow his counsel to be cautious as serpents and innocent as doves among the wolves. We will be true to God's purpose, proclaiming it and working in harmony with it. We will be true to his word, publishing it in its purity and preaching no falsehoods in his name. We will be true to his spirit, never putting it to the test with a false hypocritical conduct within his organization, but letting his spirit move us to a truthful course of conduct before all his sheep. To his sheep, we will speak the truth for their edification and protection, never betraying them to the fangs of the wolves. As sheep among wolves, we will keep preaching under our shepherd's care until all these wolves are destroyed at Armageddon and all his sheep are safe upon the green pastures and beside the still waters of Jehovah's new world of righteousness. Thank you, Brother Friends. We're very grateful for that understanding.